you join me on board the brand new seventh generation Ford Mustang, where the first thing I want to talk about is this, the handbrake. It looks mechanical, but it's actually electric. But instead of just on or off, it has some tricks up its sleeve. Like a mechanical brake, you can pull it on progressively, but it also has a drift mode. And in that mode, it locks the back wheels instantly when you give it a yank. It's Ford having a bit of fun and it encapsulates the whole car. We'll come back to the rest of the interior later. Now I know the seventh generation Mustang isn't actually that new. It was launched at the end of last year, but it's the first time we've been up close and had a play with it. So we've come and done an amazing adventure, which has involved covering the car in silly stickers, which gives the game away as to where we are. But for this film, I want to start here. The Mustang is Ford at its most gung-ho. It has not bent an inch towards environmental concerns or new technology. It's as old school as they come. Naturally aspirated V8 up front, six-speed manual gear lever in the middle and drive out the back. Doesn't it seem a bit odd to you that Ford is keeping the Mustang alive while killing off almost everything else? Anything that isn't an SUV is being abandoned in America, while in Europe we are losing the Fiesta, Mondeo and Focus. The push apparently is for crossovers and electrification, but that looks a bit iffy given the Mustang is coming to Europe next year complete with CO2 emissions of around 300 grams a kilometre. It's business, of course. You've got to sell what sells. And the last generation Mustang was hugely popular. When it came to Europe, it outsold the Audi TT and the Porsche Cayman. It was Europe's best-selling coupe. But Ford also needs to turn a profit, which is the real reason the Mustang isn't actually that new. In essence, it's more of a good midlife facelift. The suspension, chassis and engines are all carried over. So let's start at the front and talk you through it, starting with the engine. Yeah, for jokes worth making once, it's worth making again and again. Anyway, the engines. The Mustang's available with the same two as before, the 5-litre V8 Coyote engine and the 2.3-litre four-cylinder turbocharged EcoBoost. Both have been uprated a bit. The 5 litres had more work done on it. It breathes more easily. It's got bigger intakes. So power's gone up from 450 to 480 horsepower, which is a decent amount. It's got 415 pounds foot of torque as well. The 2.3 litre EcoBoost with that twin scroll turbo, that hasn't gained quite as much. It's gone up five horsepower, that's it, up to 315. It can only be had with the 10 speed automatic. But the most interesting thing about that isn't that it has 10 speeds anymore. It's that with the automatic, you can not only start it with the key fob, you can also rev it. The styling hasn't rocked the boat either. It's very much a Mustang, just with sharper angles and cuts at the front and back. Again, a sense that the old one was doing what it needed to do, so a decent freshen up is all that's required. The rumour is that Ford looked at every conceivable approach for the new Mustang, including hybrid and full electric, before deciding to punt the problem down the road for a while. The result is a car that holds the fort and comes across as a little neater and torter. And of course, Ford says it is the most athletic Mustang ever. They never say less athletic, do they? But in essence, it is the same car, the same steel chassis with McPherson strut and multi-link rear axle. In fact, the biggest change to the dynamics is the steering, which has now got a faster rack and stiffer mounting points. But if you really care about the driving, you need the performance pack, which I'm gonna crouch down by the front wheel now, which I've just noticed is filthy and should have been cleaned earlier, but it's a $5,000 option that gives you wider wheels and tires, a strut brace, a mechanical limited slip differential, that's a good one, you need that, and the bigger Brembo brakes from the Dark Horse. These are 390 millimeters rather than 352. And once you've added that, you will probably want to add the MagnaRide adaptive dampers for another $1,750. Because for me, they give the dynamics a sophistication that they otherwise lack. Right, let's move inside. Welcome to the cabin of the Ford Mustang. And let's start with the driving environment, shall we, since I'm here. 
I do like the action of everything. The clutch, which is a long travel, the brakes positive, the, there's a chunky solidity to it, which suits the car to all the controls. And the driving position is good. You've got a large range of adjustment on the steering and the seat. One of the irritations though, is that I've got an electric seat base, but the back is a flick up handle. It never returns to the place it should. And the seats, although they're very comfortable for long journeys, aren't very supportive. Anyway, practicality. I'm sure Ford claims there are a few millimetres more legroom in the back and litres in the boot. However, the boot's big, got no issue with that, but the back seats, your legs might just be okay, but your head won't be. You'll be pressed right up against the glass. Okay, moving on. Design and materials. It's chunkily built from chunky materials, but they're not the last word in quality. However, I do quite like the shaping of some of it. I like this strip around the Mustang badge and air vent. I don't like the carbon fibre around it, that's a bit cheap, but that's quite nice. And then moving across, you arrive at this enormous array of screen, two screens really, put together. And there's some quite neat stuff you can do in there. If you press the Mustang button, which brings up this screen, you can press your track apps, and then this is where Ford's gung-ho elements get kick-started all over again. You've got your acceleration and brake timers, your lap timer. There's a launch setting here, so you can select the revs at which your clutch drops when you do a launch control, and so on and so forth. It's also where you can switch on your drift brake so it locks instantly rather than easing on launch control and the rev match for the gearbox, which works well. It's quite hard to heel and toe really nicely in this car. Use rev match, it works better. And then if you go back, you can come down to cluster theme and alongside normal and then sport, which is worse than normal because you get silly hockey sticks, track, which just makes everything big on the screen and puts a massive bar across. There's calm, which just gives you one central dial. It's quite nice if you're driving at night. And then down the bottom, there is one called Fox Body 87 to 93, which gives you retro graphics. I think I'll just stick with normal. The cabin has moved things on more than the bodywork. It's sleeker and more modern in here. Everything's been tidied up and tucked away. You guessed it, in the screens, which isn't the best solution. But it's a decent cabin for a car that's not too much money. Inevitably, prices have crept upwards, but in the US, the Mustang EcoBoost starts at under $31,000. And the one you want, the V8, is 42 and a half. And yes, that's less than £35,000 for a 480 horsepower V8. It wasn't expensive in the UK last time round either, and you can pretty much guarantee it won't be when it comes to Europe in spring 2024. Prices haven't yet been announced, but we've got to be looking at what? 40k for the EcoBoost and under 50 for the V8? That's tolerable. And it's not like it's going to have very many rivals. You can't get a hold of a Toyota GR86. The Jaguar F-Type is expensive and as old as whatever scenery it's driving through. The Porsche Cayman is going electric and the Audi TT dies this year. And don't think that is a trend that is limited to Europe. In America, Dodge has announced the demise of the Charger and the Challenger, and Chevy is believed to be phasing out the Camaro. And then what? Well, the Mustang will be America's last remaining affordable sports car, and that, I suspect, is the whole aim. The Mustang, one of the world's first sports cars, will be the last one standing.